this is the first time a watch has ever been available for general public. Usually these watches are ordered, you know, five, six, seven years in advance, mm. and they're made specifically for a client. But this is the first time I've ever had the opportunity to design for a wider audience. And that has been really exciting. I've been able to get back to basics, as it were. We're still completing the piece. Um, oh, okay, right. So it's, it's, uh, it's, if the show was tomorrow, you'd be in trouble. Uh, uh, very much so in trouble, yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. As part of Watch Gecko's build-up to the much-anticipated Alliance of British Watch and Clockmakers show in March, we've been travelling the country to meet UK-based watch brands who are attending. However, today I am lucky to be having a chat with a gentleman who is an integral part of the global watch culture and development and requires no introduction. Roger Smith, thank you so much for giving up some of your valuable time for Watch Gecko. Hello, Richard. Very nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today. One of the principal reasons we're here, as I alluded to in the, in the intro, is that we're very excited about this show in March, simply because it's the inaugural one. And it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a statement that the British watch industry is here. How did the inspiration for the show come around? Well, actually, the, um, I mean, the Alliance has now been going for just over three years. But actually, the idea for British Watchmakers Day came about um, some two years previously, almost sort of four, well, four or five years ago. It came out through conversations uh, between myself and uh, Mike France and then Alistair Audsley, um, our CEO. And actually, he, interestingly, he's, he's a keen vinyl collector. He I know. He was telling us about, yeah, he, he was telling us about a similar situation that arose in the vinyl industry many years ago, where vinyl sales were on their knees and the industry was looking to revitalize itself. And they decided to have, and I've forgotten the name of it, but a British Record Day or something similar to that. And whereby there were limited runs of various vinyls printed and then distributed throughout record stores. Uh, throughout the UK. Th this was really sort of pivotal in the resurgence in vinyl sales. And so, yeah, un unashamedly, you know, this idea has been taken and we're using it for British Watchmakers Day. Yeah, we, we did a, a wonderful interview with Alistair. He was very kind. He gave us up some time and it was fascinating to talk to him about his vinyl collection, which was enormous behind him. Mm. I didn't think mm. that many records existed. <laughs> What would you say are the principal goals and aims of the show? I mean, we've got the show up and running now. It's there, There's a huge sense of anticipation. What What are your aims and goals out of it? I think it's really just to uh, let everyone know that British watchmaking is, is well, watch and clock making is now back and here to stay and it's, it's to be taken seriously. When we first launched... The Alliance, as I say, just over three years ago, we were having a bit of an in-house bet as to how many train members there would be out there. And we sort of thought that maybe 20, 25, and we hoped to maybe get, we thought we would do well if we managed to get sort of, I don't know, maybe 10 people on, 10 trade people on board. And uh, within a f uh, couple of weeks, we had 25. And that has now grown to... I think about 85 trade members, and Gosh. that has been quite incredible. So this event is really just to let everyone know that British watchmaking and clockmaking is, is here, it's here to stay. We're also trying to open it up to as many people, not just uh, people involved in watch collecting or clock collecting, but we're trying to open it up to people outside of the trade, trying to let people know that we are a sector. You know, it's not always just about people sitting at benches making watches and clocks. It's about everyone else being involved in that. And, you know, everyone from sales through to mm. accounting, through to design, you know, it's the whole broad spectrum of, of of jobs that are sort of available within the industry. Yeah, it's been really interesting. I mean, I've been in the industry for about five years when I was pulled out of retirement to do this. And uh, simply because of my throughout my entire life and careers, I've just had a love of watches and I've always bought them. And what I've noticed is that there's a genuine passion and love, irrespective of what position people hold within the companies. So, for example, uh, 
a couple of weeks ago we went down to film with Zero West and everybody's there's this huge driving passion irrespective of what people do there and people will I mean what I'm trying to get to is it was interesting I saw an interview the other day where you were saying you had approached the British government about the watch industry in general to which somebody curtly replied there wasn't one yeah yeah I mean that well that's true and we uh, ourselves, Mike France and uh, Malster and myself, you know, again, we were in a sim- similar position when we started talking about it. We felt that something was happening, but nobody was talking about it. And we kind of had this sense that there were companies about there, but nobody was talking about it. And likewise, yeah, we've, we've been involved with government from day one. You know, that's been very important to us to l- make sure they know that we are here. Yeah. And... Yes, they, they they didn't know that watchmaking existed. They I don't know if they actually knew that it did exist many many years ago. But actually, actually, what was interesting was that that led us to doing the Bellwether report, which we did I think almost three years ago, to to work out the size and scope of the sector. And um, yeah, it's a very revealing bit of work. First time it's ever been done, but uh, we now know you know, where we are, you know, that we do have a sector, that it is growing. And there's, you know, plenty of uh, room for many more members to join it and sort of help it develop. So so for people maybe not so familiar with that, what exactly were the findings of that report? This was, as, as I say, three years ago. So it's a £150 million sector. About 450 people were involved in it. Um, it'll come as no surprise that the majority of trade members were reliant upon outside watchmaking nations mm. in places like Switzerland and China and Japan and so on, uh, Germany, for the vast proportion of all parts found in watches and clocks. That's no surprise. We lost our industry. Uh, well, we started to lose it in the sort of 1850s and it finally died off in you know the sort of 19, late 1970s uh, sorry, late 1960s, early 1970s. So um, that came as no surprise. Actually, what, one of the interesting things for me uh, was that the vast majority of our trade members have come from outside of the what I would call traditional watchmaking trade. And actually, I think that's been to our advantage mm. because, yeah, um, you know, watchmakers are generally not not great at business, not great at developing and so on, not great at looking at opportunities out there. Uh, We kind of generally can be quite inward looking people. But our trade today has been supported by people from outside with fresh ideas, fresh stories. Mm. Um, They don't have this sort of blinkered view to what the watchmaking industry could be. And I think that is a huge advantage and that's something which i believe is particularly unique to what we have in here in britain today you know the fact that people are from outside of this traditional watchmaking area yeah i, I think it's one thing i've certainly noticed is that you're right when you get a i don't know what a collective bunch of watch enthusiasts is called yeah. perhaps that's a, a word we need to create yes um but when you do get such a a, a gathering uh, most people have drifted into it through passion, enthusiasm over years. What I find fascinating is one of our authors for Watch Gecko and one of my closest friends is in his 20s and he's really, really now passionately passionate about watches. It's lovely to see him at the start of the journey as well. Mm. Mm. And it's nice to see somebody of that age group who's so enthusiastic and wants to learn because a lot of us really drifted into it at a much later stage in life. But we've, you're right, we've come from other businesses, we've come from uh-huh. commercial backgrounds where we've got something we can bring to it as well as the passion for watches. So this, the, the event in March, a um, couple of things that, I mean, do you think it's going to be an annual event? Is that how you'd like to see it transpire? That's certainly, yeah, very much the hope. And um, I think already some people are talking about it being an annual event, but yeah, we don't, you know, that's that's always been our ambition. I mean, I think for me, there are so many people now, so many of these trade members are now creating a unique watch for this particular day. So there's huge enthusiasm 
from the people who are exhibiting. Exhibiting. So yeah, I see no reason why I can't c- carry on. We, we've been lucky enough as our as our tour of the UK goes on, visiting people to interview them prior to the show. We've been lucky enough to see some of the. Uh, the, the special edition sneak previews. We've been sworn to secrecy. We've had to sign our names in blood that we won't talk about things. Um, that must be from your perspective, obviously as a watchmaker, I would imagine, really exciting to see what people are creating for this day mm. as a, as a, as a symbol of how important the day is. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you're right. And, uh, I'm, equally in the dark as to what's being created. Uh, and I, know of a, I, I thought I've you seen, might have blueprints everywhere. No, no, no. And actually, I, you know, I'm purposely not asking, you know, Alistair and Katia, our team, uh, what is going on. I mean, I've, I have seen um, Neil Duckworth's piece, which is great and very exciting. Looking forward to seeing that in person. But equally, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to the event. I'm looking forward to that day to see what people have done. I've heard again lots of rumors about what is being created. Some some of the series are very very small, maybe one or two pieces. Other people I've heard are doing 10, 20 pieces. Apart from that, I'm looking forward to meeting you know the fellow trade members because yeah, as you sure. said, you know mentioned this is our first live trade event and it's going to be great just to sort of be able to touch base with these people and you know put faces to the names and um you know just it's going to be a good day. I know it. <laughs> to be honest, yeah, we were saying, whilst we're obviously, we're there as a media partner and we've got a, a stand as Gakota, we're really excited about obviously presenting our wares like anybody else's. But we've said as a group, the thing we're most excited about is being in a room with a collective bunch of yeah. interested people, just meeting people, putting faces to names for the first time, just like-minded people, because we're all going to be so swept up in the passion of it by the end of the day. And I think if the day achieved just that, it would be a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now, talking of special editions, dot, 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 <laughs> what are you planning for the day? What can you tell us? So, yeah, I mean, we've been working on this on a watch now for, I think it, it, by the time it's completed, almost about 11 months so we're bringing along a wristwatch. It's going to be – it's a Series 1 wristwatch. Okay. Uh, case in 18 karat gold, uh, red gold, with a mixed metal gold and silver dial. And actually, it's, it's, it's an exciting project. And the reason why is because this is the first time, I think, since I made my your pocket watch – you know, back, the, the second pocket watch, well, all of the pocket watches, but it's the first time I've actually been able to sit down and design a w- watch. I, I'm going to say for myself, um, it, it won't be for myself, but, um, it's the first time we've, we, we're not making a watch or I haven't designed a watch that isn't going to a client. Right. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And that has been really exciting. And, um, I've been able to get back to basics as it were. And you know, have you you, felt, has that given you a bit of freedom, more creative freedom? I mean, without a doubt, it has. To be honest, my design philosophy is is fairly basic. I think less is always more, but it's been quite refreshing just to go back to that. And another you know, key kind of feature of this watch is that this is the first time a watch has ever been available for general public. Usually, these watches are ordered you know, five, six, seven years in advance, mm. and they're made specifically for a client. But this is the first time I've ever had the opportunity to design for a wider audience and for myself. And that's, yeah, been particularly gratifying. We're still completing the piece. Um, oh, okay, right. So it's, it's, uh, it's, if the show was tomorrow, you'd be in trouble. Uh, uh, very much so in trouble, yeah. <laughs> But, um, no, it, it's coming along very well. And, um, I mean, it will definitely be ready in time. But um, as with all these things, you know, it takes takes a lot mm. of effort. Oh, absolutely. So is there anything unique that you've put into this which is um, symbolic of the day? Is there anything you, you new you're, you're showing us? I, I've tried not to personalise it specifically for the event. You know, this is about uh, me being able to create something very unique, something that. I haven't had the opportunity to design for a while. Um, it's got a different engraved design on the barrel bridge, which is uh, a new sort of 
uh, very very new to us, and it's very English. Um, I suppose some would say very classic design. I mean, one one of the things I wanted to hopefully explore with you, which is a question which we've kind of thrown at a lot of people, was what a British watch was. And and we've had some great answers from people. And we've also had a lot of head scratching from people. Mm. And did you feel there was any particular characteristic? You mentioned the engraving you've said is particularly English. Obviously, I'm assuming the aesthetic design. Yeah. Was there any particular characteristic, be it aesthetic or technical, you felt the need to get into this new Series 1? I suppose this particular watch is not radically different from anything else. I'd just like to say that. It is very English. For me, English watchmaking at its sort of higher end has always been very much about innovation. It's been very much about the timekeeping focus. You know, that goes, that DNA goes through all of our watches. So at the heart of this particular watch, well, as, as, all, as ever, we have the coaxial escapement, which is, mm-hmm. you know, in, in my mind, it's the most mechanically efficient escapement available on the market today, anywhere in the market. I've watched your door video. Oh, yes, yes. That, that, I understood it for pretty much the first time. Good, good, it worked. <laughs> it did. Um, for me, the coaxial escapement, what it, it opened my eyes to was this super efficiency. This is something that I'm now working on in the mechanism as a whole. You know, once you have a really great escapement uh, that delivers such efficient power, you can then start to look at reducing the mainspring strengths within the watch. And that's something which is very much at the heart. So, so for me, English watchmaking, to try and answer your question, has always about, been about mechanical innovation. Mm-hmm. It's not about just making a watch that looks good, looks pretty, and tells the time. It's about trying to improve mechanical timekeeping. And this is something that, you know, I've also taken to heart from George. You know, that was his drive and focus. And of I course. suppose this is what why we're doing what we're doing today. Because of your quest for technical excellence, then, do you find this is a, is this just a perpetual problem you, you face? Is it, um, are you chasing something that you think, I don't know if I'll ever get there? Is it, Will you ever be satisfied? That This is a very personal question because I'm just wondering, at what point do you say, I don't know if I can do anything more with the physics of what I've got? When we're looking to make an, an improvement to the coaxial, you know, you're talking about you know, shaving microns off a particular component or something. It is really about obsessing about the minutiae mm. of the whole mechanism, uh, well, of the escapement and the mechanism, as a whole, and it is a very obsessive sort of uh, path to take. We're also, we have been working for uh, many years with Manchester Metropolitan University, and you know they're very much involved in nanotechnology. And so, again, an area, we really don't know how far we will get with this, but our, our ultimate goal would be to remove all lubrication from a mechanical wristwatch mm-hmm. more all traditional lubrication, should I say. So oils, applied oils. Um, we don't know if we will achieve it. The, there is a lot of hope within the team, but we've still got a huge amount of work to do to get there. So we'll see. It's, it's, it's a journey, but it's a fascinating journey, you know, to be on, really. You know, it is, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, there, we see, you know, um, in a commercial sense, you see the, the Cosk and Meta certifications that comes with watches and, there, there is always an argument that sometimes we write about in the magazine as to how much does that actually relate to a person in their everyday life. But I think what you're doing is on such a, it's on such a different level. It kind of reminds me of, say, motorsport at, a, at, a, at its extreme. Um, mm. If you're watching Christian Horner talking about shaving a tenth of a second off at somewhere on Silverstone Circuit, and you think, how can that really matter? But of course it does. It's all part of a holistic package that if you can do it, and I kind of, it's the same analogy I would draw to the watches. Yeah, very much so. At this point then, do watches become into something that's almost something intangible? Um, something that is more than the sum of their parts. Um, I, we, all, we all have watches in our collection that mean something more to us than being a watch. Is that the philosophy you come from as well? Oh, gosh, that's a difficult... I always struggle with uh, when we get into philosophical uh, discussions. Um, 
I, I think for me, what really draws me to to watchmaking is the mechanics of it. Yeah, yeah, that is really my interest. And actually, I have a fairly modest collection of watches here from you know many different brands. And, and really, I've been drawn to those in I'd say in most part through the mechanism. Yeah. You know, these are watches that I experienced when I was younger and when I was learning the trade and um, full of enthusiasm to learn and experience as many different calibers as possible. And, you know, these watches were often out of my league at the time, um, but now I can afford these. I mean, they're very simple watches, you know, Amiga chronographs and Hoya caliber, you know, 12s and so on. And so, yeah, I'm very much led by the mechanical side of it and the efficiency side of it. And that is really what draws me in. And the idea that you can create a watch that ticks five times per second and, well, in our case, five times per second, and day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out, that is quite an incredible achievement for any mechanical device to achieve, to, to do. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it, it's the whole package, really, that sort of really draws me in. Yeah, it's really interesting that because we actually we were talking about that quite recently to someone is that a lot of us get um, we did a podcast on it on the reassurance you get from a watch that in a mm. fairly uncertain world, it's something that is extremely reliable that is with you every day. Yeah. And there is almost a, there is a degree of comfort and confidence that comes with that. I, mm. I certainly feel that with some of mine. Mm. Is, is there a commercial movement? Uh, when I say commercial, I mean something that would be in a dealer that I would or a, or a boutique that I would buy today as opposed to something completely bespoke from yourself is there one that you would say is as good as it gets currently that's commercially available that's a good question I mean the yeah there are there are many watches I like um I think for me I suppose one of the more recent mechanical watches that I bought was the Amiga Speedmaster with the is it 3861, caliber 3861 movement in it, which has a coaxial escapement, you know. Yeah. And actually, for me, that ticked all the boxes, you know, as an iconic moon watch, as an iconic piece in its own right. But I think for what what made it special for me was the fact that they then went, looked into their back catalogue and mm -hmm. chose the eight, caliber 861, and they reimagined it uh, with the coaxial escapement in there. So for me, it has everything in there. That's, you know, yeah. it's got the, there, there is something about these more vintage mechanisms which have a certain charm, which some of the modern movements just don't have. You know, everything's been dumbed down probably due to speed and, yeah, speed of manufacturer and design and efficiency and so mm. on. But I like something which has this sort of more artistic sort of look to it. And, and then combined with the coaxial, it's just a great watch. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, we, we, I, I hear you. I hear you. To me, it's um, uh, what was my interview with Andrew Morgan. We said it was, we both reckoned it was the ultimate tool watch. Yeah. That was yeah. It. We said if, yeah. if we both said, if you could buy one watch, go yes. buy a Speedmaster Moon watch because yeah. it's, it is, to, again, it's a word, a cor a corny work, iconic. You know, mm. it is. Um, Very much so. And you're also getting some, especially if you, I mean, I, I personally don't have the the crystal back because I like the Hesalite crystal, the Moonwatch, the classic yes. Buzz Aldrin-y type Moonwatch. Yes. <clears throat> but in the office, we have one with the crystal display back. And it's just a thing of beauty. Mm. How do you see the future of, of British watchmaking? I mean, I know obviously you haven't got a crystal ball in front of you. So how do you see it? And dare I ask you, where would you love to see it go? I mean, look, I'd, I'd love to see um, manufacturing being brought back to Britain. You know, I think everyone would love that. We'd all like to see factories with lots of people in them and churning out British movements and making cases and dials and hands. Mm. That would be the dream. But um, I'm afraid reality has to kick in. And we are a long, long, long way from that. And... The reason being is quite simply because we lost our industry. Our industry was mismanaged many, many years ago. And uh, we lost that core base knowledge. And, you know, yeah. I, I say to people, I say, you know, well, we can all buy the same machines. We can buy the same machines that are, are used in Switzerland or 
China or Japan or Germany, we can all buy that. But what's gone is our depth of knowledge, you know. Oh and when you're involved in manufacturing, it's not just about pressing a big green button to make a part. You then have to have that knowledge to take that component and to take it through the multitude of different stages uh, right through to a completed component. And that's the real challenge. And that's something that I think we will find it very, very hard to bring back. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't want to become too despondent. Um, where we are at nowadays, uh, today in British watch and clock making is that we have to be open and honest and we have to appreciate that in order for us to succeed, we have to be reliant upon existing watchmaking nations because they have the machines and they have the know-how. That's, that's what we don't have, that know-how. And uh, they can translate our ideas into something great. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of uh, basically where we are. But I do think things will happen. I mean, you know, here, you know, in this workshop, we are making a complete watch. And the only components we don't make are the balance spring, mainspring and jewels. And, you know, to gain that knowledge... I mean, admittedly, you know, we're doing 18 pieces a year, but to gain that knowledge has been really hard fought and we've had to make a huge number of mistakes and there have been very difficult times along the way. But I do think that some people, you know, small pockets will develop. I mean, I have heard conversations about somebody wishing to make their own cases uh, within Britain. And, you know, there are already people, if you look at Mr. Jones' watches, he's already doing his dials. So he's perfecting the dial manufacturing. I think it'll start to snowball from there, but people just picking off very specific tasks. One thing we do have in Britain is great design and great mm -hmm. stories. I think this is going to be very evident to everyone who visits British Watchmakers Day on the 9th of March. I think that ingenuity, creativity will come across in, you know, hopefully spades. Again, speaking to several trade members, you know, they are really heavily involved in their suppliers, you know, whether that is in Switzerland or China or wherever, you know, great relationships are being built, which will be really useful for us in this interim phase, however, this, the, however long this will take. It's almost like you see it as a generational thing. It's it's going mm. to take the next <clears throat> generation inspired by, say, someone like yourself's enthusiasm to – it's almost like we're starting from scratch. Yeah, it is. We are starting from scratch. Which is probably a little frustrating when we did have the <laughs> inherent knowledge maybe 200 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like, I mean, as I say, said before, we're making 18 watches a year and we know how to do that very, very well. It's very difficult to make 18 watches a year. You know, there's, it's a highly complex process. And people have spoken to me over the years and said, okay, are you going to sort of up numbers? And, you know, would you like to create a watch, you know, where you make a thousand pieces a year or whatever? And actually that would terrify me because mm. although I know how to make 18 watches well, to scale that up is again, a very, very different proposition to making what we're doing today. I mean, it's, it's you know, you're into a completely different world where suddenly tolerances are incredibly important. And to achieve that yeah. on a day-in, day-out basis mm. across a range of, I don't know, 150, 200 components is, yeah, sure. is, is a big ask. So You'd probably need to recruit the whole island as well. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we would. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I think all we can hope is that uh, I think we all dearly hope that the show in March is is a catalyst for this. Mm. Mm. It, is, it is. It's the first time we've all got together in a room, other than a little red bar event where we're sitting having a coffee. Yeah, it, it, it's the first chance. I, I suspect so many of these people from the industry will have actually ever met one another. Yeah. And well, been agree. together. And if we could hook a microphone up to everybody in that room and hear all the conversations in the margins, I mm. think we'd we'd get some wonderful conversations. Very much so. Yeah, I mean, the, there's certainly enthusiasm there. There's no doubt about it. Oh, there is. And I can tell you, as as watch journalists, as we've been going around interviewing people, and we've got another, we did a scooter the other day, we've got another one coming in next week that we're going to interview. 
everybody's really fired up about the day. So from mm. your perspective, you can take, I guess you can take a lot of heart from that, that you, you're creating something great here that everybody's passionately behind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, like, like you, I've only really just cottoned onto the buzz about it. And thanks to people like yourself, you know, who are sharing those experiences. And, you know, on the Isle of Man, you know, it can be, yeah, we don't get out <laughs> as much as we should. But no, there is, but actually, I was in, funnily enough, I was in Dubai last year, towards the end of last year. And there's excitement about it there. And I know several people will be flying over. And um, there is a worldwide interest amongst collectors there's no doubt about it and i've heard of many people who've who are are booking international flights to come and visit for the day have you any idea how many people i mean what what kind of numbers do you think might come i think i think we have 700 tickets sold already oh wonderful and i think there's room for more so um I don't think there's many much more room, but um, no, I was going to say, but you know, you get any, all the industry in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if you know, you really need to get this booked. If if people aren't, haven't booked, it's going to be a yeah. very busy day. You heard it here, guys. Get it booked. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Roger. Um, I'm sure you've got a watch to finish. <laughs> well, I know you have. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, all I can say is thank you so much for giving up a little bit of your time today for us. Um, I'm really looking forward to meeting you on the day and yep, really right. excited to see what you're bringing. Is there a parting thought about the show you'd like to leave with us? Well, I, I'm as nervous and excited as probably maybe you are. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I mean, for me, this is a culmination of many years of planning. Uh, we have a wonderful team with Alistair and Katya who are doing the doing the work behind this you know it, it's it's huge credit to them this is all happening and um but yeah i suppose a parting shot is i'm just looking forward to meeting many train members mm. um but also the collectors you know they're they are our future absolutely the but- more and more collectors we can get and also new collectors people from outside of the you know traditional collecting world watch collecting mm. world you know i'm hoping to see a lot of new faces out there and yeah, people who might this might day. be their first experience of a watch event. yeah 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 and um yeah i mean i'm I'm taking down a team of watchmakers the three of them coming down again just in the hope that there are a lot of people maybe people as i say who are out who haven't got watchmaking knowledge and are keen to learn and you know that's why you know the the team of three are coming down to chat to these people and hopefully engage with a new group of collectors what a wonderful thing to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. It's been great to chat to you. 